We are seeing it everywhere on the internet, social media, everywhere that China is about to collapse. And in this video, we're going to talk about whether that is actually going to be the case. And I'm going to provide an objective analysis of the situation. We're going to be discussing China's real estate market softness that's been greatly discussed everywhere. We're going to talk about how the real estate market in China may impact the broader economic landscape. But what I will talk about today that not a lot of other people are is that China's recent economic struggles is actually a silver lining for the Chinese internet sector. And we're going to be talking about what we've been doing inside our community. So if you're new to my channel, my name is Larry. I talk about US and China investment strategy. Turn on the bell, hit that like button if you like the research. Let's get started. Now, if you haven't yet already, make sure to follow me on Instagram, where I also from time to time talk about investment strategy, motivational content and life perspectives and beware of impersonators. I only have one account and I will not DM you about crypto. Now, recently on my Twitter, which you should follow as well, I shared my opinion on Chinese Internet stocks. And here's what I said. I said, China Internet stocks, Alibaba, Tencent, JD, KWeb, they still represent good value in a very expensive market. And I get a lot of questions always asking me in the comments section, Larry, what do you think about Alibaba? And so long as Alibaba is in this valuation range, 11 and a half times to 12 and a half times forward earnings, this is my final response. I think it represents good value. The one thing that can invalidate my thesis is if there is a full blown US China war slash Taiwan attack. I think in that case, no stocks are safe. But absent that situation, I think that China is selling at a very reasonable discount to historical norms. Now, make sure to also be on my email list where I share practical public investment strategy. So links are in the description below. Now, here is the situation in China that perhaps has you worried. We have a lot of these wonderful thumbnails, as you can see here. And these are some of the creators whom I admire very much. They make very good content. And this is not about the creators. This is about the concept itself, about whether it makes sense. I need you to have some common sense and ask yourself, is there a due date on the economic collapse of an entire country? Is it actually possible that a country is going to collapse in say 29 days or 25 days. I want you to think about that for a moment. These are some amazing thumbnails, I must say, from some amazing creators, but I need you to think for a second, is this actually going to happen? Now, I understand the skepticism and I understand the intense concern. After all, China's local banks has suspected corruption issues from bad actors. And here is what I can agree on that China has no shortage of real economic issues. That is true. There is no denying that the challenges are deep. I'm not going to debate that. But the economic data from PMIs to retail sales to industrial production, even though they've been soft in recent months, a lot of this is priced in to the Chinese internet sector where Alibaba is priced as if consumption has grinded to a complete halt. Alibaba sells at 12.5 to 12.8 times forward earnings compared to the S&P, which is closer to 17 times earnings, where in the US inflation is still north of 8.5% CPI. Now, China real estate, it is one of the biggest worries within the buy side when it comes to a credit event. And I do have to agree with this. There are issues in China's real estate market. We'll talk about that. So now we're going to talk about the real estate issues in China. And I want to discuss the pre-sales model that China has in the real estate industry. And in 2021, more than 90% of all residential property sales were pre-sales. And what that means is that people, they buy a house off a of plan. And as long as credit keeps flowing, Developers can continue building their planned real estate projects. But when credit stops flowing, 
then real estate projects could go unfinished and people end up continuously making mortgage payments on stalled projects, on construction that isn't continuing. And we know that's a problem. That is precisely what is happening right now with mortgage boycotts and stalled economic growth in several major provinces in China. And we can see here that the real estate industry has definitely impacted GDP growth, industrial output, and also retail sales. And social unease is coming from recent banking scandals in the smaller cities in China. And on top of this, youth unemployment is also high, and this is containing consumer confidence. But here's where I'd like to remind you where opportunities are often found during maximum pessimism. I'll, I'll give you some examples. During the March, April, May timeframe, when on my public content, I strongly discussed the opportunity for a large rebound in Chinese internet, that investment thesis was met with intense skepticism in the YouTube comment section. And while I want all of my wonderful viewers to know that I did not make a public video telling my friends here to sell their positions because I can't do that, inside my private community and on my email list, I strongly hinted at the fact that Alibaba, when it had approached that 120 to 130 range that you might remember, that its valuation multiple had gotten too close to the S&P 500. And at that point, investors might have options. So for investors who understood what I was actually trying to say and they could read in between the lines, that was a moment of risk reduction. And I guided on when people should have added risk. I guided on when people should have reduced risk. And those moments, I know I could feel it myself there were moments of excessive pessimism and there were moments of excessive optimism as well. And in this situation that we have here today, the excessive pessimism in the real economy in China, it can cause an overreaction by the PBOC to ease significantly. And this can once again change investor perceptions and positioning. And understanding China's strategy through Western lens is extraordinarily difficult. The party will not allow for the crisis to structurally disrupt their image. We can see here that not a single economist polled by Bloomberg had predicted that the PBOC would further cut rates. And now that the PBOC is proactively doing QE, in contrast to the rest of the world, we need to understand that China's low fundamental valuations, they already reflect the soft economic reality on the ground. But once the economic picture brightens even a little bit, the valuation recovery will be incredibly swift in the same manner that we saw during that April, May, June timeframe of this year. We can see here that the H shares banks, the Chinese companies listed in Hong Kong, they're trading at near all-time lows in terms of price to book. And this already reflects the deep pessimism surrounding the financial sector because of the real estate crisis. So here's a critical reminder. The rest of the world will soon face tremendous tightening from the U.S. Fed, and their impact is going to make the U.S. dollar even stronger, which is going to weaken many other emerging markets. On the other hand, China is easing. And also remember that PBOC officials, Guo Shuqing and Yi Gang, they work for Xi Jinping and the party. And the PBOC is not independent from politics. And if the party asks them to stimulate, they will do so. So we can understand from the M2 money supply that this is exactly what's happening in China. And there's clear proof that China is stimulating while the rest of the world puts a break on easing. Let's take a look at the US M2 money supply. The growth year over year for M2 money supply peaked in 2021. And while the US is still technically growing its money supply, it's growing it a lot slower than it did in 2021. Conversely, in China, the M2 money supply is increasing. And this will soon improve the liquidity picture of its economy. This will, of course, take time. Also, from JP Morgan's recent analysis, the China Credit Impulse Index is starting to bounce from the lows. 
And this means that China's accommodative policy stance is going to continue to diverge from their Western counterparts. Now, let's take a look at China's medium-term lending facility rate, short for MLF. It's being continuously cut. And this is important to follow because this is the main rate at which the central bank lends to big commercial banks. And China's stimulus policies are not just monetary, they're also fiscally related. They're also targeting credit policy. They're also targeting supply chain. They're targeting consumption and also infrastructure. So on top of the MLF rate cuts, the policy measures that China is enacting is quite broad in nature. And this is important because we should not fight the Fed and we should also not fight the PBOC. So for short sellers who continue to bet against the Chinese internet sector, they're essentially betting against an environment where liquidity is going to start flowing and becoming more healthy down the line, not necessarily today. Now, from a travel perspective, the stance on zero COVID may soon change after President Xi gets reelected and reopening travel to China can also improve sentiment. And with that, let's take a quick break. And since we're on the topic of China's travel policies, I'd like to introduce the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark. Now, the last time I was personally in mainland China and Hong Kong was back in 2015. And since China's zero COVID policy in 2020, the policymakers have made travel in and out of the country a little bit challenging. And as of right now, there is a 14 day quarantine period for US citizens to visit China. But I expect global travel to China to get back to more pre pandemic levels after President Xi gets reelected for his historical third term later this fall. And when global travel is back, I plan to make a trip to China and Hong Kong. Now in China, there are a lot of US based applications that can't work like YouTube, Gmail, or even Patreon. However, using Surfshark, I can use its VPN service to continue my internet based work in China without interference. My work is location independent now. And if I travel to China and Hong Kong, I would need to be able to take my work with me. Surfshark will allow me to continue using the applications regardless of where I am. Now, on top of this, Surfshark allows us to have VPN service on all of our devices. That way I can access the internet in the same way across my phones, tablets, and laptops. And in my downtime, I'll be able to keep watching my favorite shows on Netflix. If you work in an industry that allows you to work anywhere in the world, but you need to keep access to your routine applications, Surfshark will allow you to do that. So get Surfshark VPN by visiting the link below, enter promo code Larry Chung for 83% off and get three extra months free. And with that said, let's get back to the content. Now, China's response to the real estate crisis is strong because the crisis is very deep. And this response may not have come if the problems were just immaterial. We can see here that China is planning 29 billion in special loans to troubled developers. And this is going to help put a backstop on the real estate issues in the industry. Now, these leading Chinese real estate companies are on my watch list to understand the situation from a bottom up analysis. Country Garden Holdings, China Bank, Sunak China Holdings, Poly Real Estate, and of course, Evergrande. Mortgage rates are falling in China, and this will slowly improve the mood within the real estate market. But what are some fundamental signals that you and I, we need to be watching? Here are some key things to watch out for. We need to really focus on unemployment. It's a big issue for youth in China. We also need to look at the health of SMEs, which is short for small medium enterprises. We need to see if there are any policies designed for jobs creation. And we also need to see if there are any policies that will help consumers and businesses in the real economy. Because the key to the recovery is small medium enterprises. The reason for that is that 99.8% of businesses in China are SMEs and 85.3% of this group include micro businesses. So this means that small firms, they contribute to more than 80% of China's non-government employment. This is very significant. So we must look for concrete evidence that policy is directly helping SMEs. So far, the policy has been aimed at cutting key lending rates. And once policy is directed at consumers and businesses, sentiment can improve rapidly. Now let's take a look at some recent earnings results from JD Tencent Alibaba. And this will help us understand the fact that public equities, 
for the Chinese internet sector is once again demonstrating that a lot of bad news is priced in. However, the window of opportunity to accumulate at the best prices typically close very quickly. Let's take a look at JD.com. So JD, they recently beat estimates and they defied China's economic slowdown. And in their earnings call transcript, which I read thoroughly, CEO Lei Xu, he says that long term, the outlook still looks good despite short term headwinds. This was in response to a question from Goldman Sachs asking them on their views of the future of consumer confidence. And inside our community, several members are very interested in the Chinese internet sector, especially my members and friends from Europe, Hong Kong, Asia Pacific. So I got a question recently about what are my opinions on JD.com. I got this question on August 18th before JD's earnings. I said that if you can hold JD for six to nine months, I believe that fundamentally speaking, it's a good company selling at a good price. But I also guide on the fact that you need to size your portfolio positioning appropriately in case other good opportunities come up as well. Up next, let's talk about Tencent. And Tencent recently reported their earnings and they posted their first ever revenue decline. But if you've been following Tencent, you would know that the company's shares have been relatively steady since this relatively disappointing earnings report. And the reason for that is in their earnings call transcript, I found something constructive. It's that CEO Pony Ma, he said that the regulatory tone is now trending towards positivity for the platform economy. And there are no new regulations this year that have been materially detrimental to the industry. That is significant for the forward outlook of the Chinese internet sector. I'm not, let's take a look at Alibaba. And Alibaba, although they rallied short term after their latest earnings, after I dissected it, I found it to be a mixed report. But if we take a look at their earnings transcript, once again, we're seeing management discuss that they're seeing signs of recovery, but it will take more time to fully recover. I found that commentary to be very objective. I found that commentary to be fair. And studying the valuation of Alibaba gives me confidence that once again, in that 11 and a half and 12 and a half forward earnings multiple range, which is equivalent to 85 to 90 per share, Alibaba is attractively priced. And I talked about this on Twitter. I said, here's the landscape that we are in. China is going to do everything they can to stabilize their economy via various QE measures. And the US must destroy inflation and may target the Fed's balance sheet next, resulting in massive QT. So do not fight the Fed and do not fight the PBOC. So here's what we've been doing inside our community. I write bi-weekly strategy reports to all of our friends inside. And in my most recent report for the August second half, which I sent out on August 15th, I said that I was continuing to be cautiously optimistic about Alibaba, Tencent, JD, and KWeb over a longer term investment horizon. And I said, as of this report, I believe that China is one of the few areas of the market that has the least valuation risk after the S&P 500's giant advance since my latest research note. And that makes sense because of China's economic issues that they're encountering right now. Now, ahead of Jackson Hole's critical event, I sent our friends another update. So very recently, I once again discussed that I continue to be cautiously optimistic on China. And I sent this note after the NASDAQ had fallen roughly 800 points from its local highs and the S&P 500 had fallen roughly 200 points off its local highs. And I continue to remind my friends inside that long-term portfolios for US equities should continue to be held, but monitor them, of course. Short-term portfolios, though, should have proactively reduced risk in that range high of 4,200, 4,400 for the S&P 500. So more important than anything is understanding your time frame. And in this note, I reiterated my cautiously optimistic stance behind Alibaba, Tencent, JD, and KWeb. So for more public commentary, follow me on Twitter, join my email list, be my friend on Instagram, links in the description below. I recently said this on Twitter. I said, I have a deeper and bigger mission to turn retail investors from impatient traders into strong research analysts. And for anyone in my community, I want their favorite word to be research because deep patience and thorough research is going to lead to long-term survival and success.
So know how to do proper investment research and you will soon be able to separate signal from noise. So I've got a quick to-do list before we wrap up. And it's that, remind yourself that you have a mission and that big resets will help you if you are positioned correctly. Find the right mentor or strategist. It can be me or it can be anyone else, but make sure to find the right person who can help you shortcut your learning process. And build up a tolerance to take pain. Use this time to develop deep patience. Use this opportunity to build skills. You can't take advantage of market dislocations if you don't have the right skills. And once opportunity comes knocking within the next 12 months, you must execute on your plan to buy the best companies or properties that you can. And you must form a plan ahead of time so that you don't get emotional when disorder comes. Because failing to plan is planning to fail. And with that said, guys, much love as always. Thank you to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. Thank you for being awesome. And I will see you guys in my next video.